All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on Geo-Reference Data to Inform Earth Observations Modeling for Agriculture, a discussion among collectors, users, and aggregators. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I'll be your webinar facilitator today, so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer session, and see my, uh, my name throughout the chat box periodically. I'm really excited about this webinar today for a few reasons. Uh, first, it's essentially the culmination of our really excellent Earth Observations Month on AgriLinks. We've been featuring a ton of interesting blog posts, some, uh, some kind of brown bag style webinars, a, a lot of interesting information, and you can find the links to most of those blog posts on the left side of your screen in the links box. So we encourage you to check out that blog series on AgriLinks. I'm also excited because it's been a little while since we've done an AgriLinks webinar. We've been going through some transitions at AgriLinks. Um, it's being managed by a new contract called the Knowledge, Data, Learning, and Training uh, Activity. And so we're excited to uh, kind of look ahead and get restarted with our AgriLinks webinar series. So before we dive into the content today, I would like to just go over a couple of items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself and let us know where you're joining from, and thanks to everyone who has been doing that already. The chat box is your main way to communicate today, and we encourage you to use it to post questions, share resources, and discuss the topic with your colleagues on the event. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll probably answer some of them along the way in the chat box, and we'll hold uh, some other questions until after the presentation. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded, and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and some additional resources once they're ready in about a week and a half's time. And they'll also be posted on the AgriLinks website. All right, I am going to go ahead and uh, get this rolling and introduce two of our speakers, uh, who will then introduce our wider suite of speakers. And the first person I'd like to introduce is Kirsten Johnson with the USAID Bureau for Food Security who has spearheaded Earth Observations Month on AgriLinks and has really done such a wonderful job bringing this information to the Feed the Future community. She is an international population and health demographer with 20 years of experience conducting in-depth analyses of demographic and health surveys and service provision assessment data. And she's currently serving as a monitoring and evaluation technical advisor in the USA Bureau for Food Security's Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Division. And you'll probably see her in the chat box, and she'll be providing a wrap-up at the end. And then the other person I'd like to introduce is Paul Tanger, who is also with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And he is an agriculture research advisor uh, with USAID BFS, where he manages biotechnology and crop improvement projects. And previously, as a AAAS Science and Technology Fellow at USDA NEPA, he led the launch of a new initiative focused on data science and agriculture, as well as developing open data policies and examining and visualizing impacts of research funding. And Paul is going to take it away and uh, kick us off with an intro to the content and to our other speakers. Paul? Thank you, Julie, and, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for, for joining today. I am happy to, to be here and, and excited about, about this topic. Um, so I'll share some brief opening comments uh, to frame the webinar today and, and lead into uh, a great lineup of speakers, followed by a discussion after, after which my colleague Kristen uh, will close uh, today's session. So I will just briefly highlight our presenters and then, and then share some, some comments and then turn it over to, to our presenters uh, to to talk in more detail about this topic. So first up, we have Narendra Das with uh, JASA, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, where he's a research scientist, um, lead developer of the SMAP mission, looking at soil moisture data. And uh, he's been working with the SERVIR project and uh, We'll be talking about some of that work in, in Asia today. Then we'll have Robert Hymans 
uh, University of California, works on uh, data science applications and international development, and uh, with an emphasis on, on modeling um, spatial variation. So he'll talk about some uses that, that he's been, been working on there. Uh, and then we have Philemon Juliana uh, with uh, Simit um, uh, Wheat Improvement, looking at, uh, she's a, a wheat breeder uh, and as part of uh, several projects has been uh, evaluating genomic selection and high throughput phenotyping methods um, for improved uh, wheat varieties. And then we have uh, Rajas Srini uh, at Texas A&M University, uh, professor and director of the Spatial Sciences Lab. He has been working on uh, the soil and water assessment tool, model and, and modeling approaches uh, using various um, sor sources of, of data. And we'll wrap up with, with two folks that will talk about the, the platforms in which some of this data, um, you know, is being used and aggregated. First with Estefania Pulisili, uh, University of Maryland, uh, Masters in Agriculture Economics. Um, she's been collaborating with, with GeoGlam and monitoring crop conditions uh, globally and uh, manages aspects of that, as well as coordinating the Agriculture Monitoring in the Americas um, uh, initiative. So last but not least, we'll have Zhao Wuku with uh, IFPRI, uh, party, part of the um, CGIR uh, platform for big data and agriculture, and looking at ways to use um, open multidisciplinary data and data science techniques uh, for sustainable uh, development impacts. All right, so I just have a couple quick comments and then I'll turn it over to our speakers. I, I think that uh, Julie already highlighted that this webinar is nearing the end of the AgriLinks theme for this month of May, Earth Observations for Food Security. Just wanted to highlight again uh, how, um, how this is part of that broader theme and encourage you all to go back and look at some of the, the content that's already been, been shared there. You'll hear today about some of these systems and, and resources, and uh, you can find more uh, with, with the link there. So I, I'm guessing you're all here because of the, the great uh, purpose statement that we, we put together, the description for this webinar, so I won't go too much time into reiter reiterating that, but instead I'll share uh, an observation. And essentially, we're hoping to improve the, the sharing and use of Earth observation data through the discussion today. So I thought this, this kind of observation captures a bit of what, what we've been thinking about and, and what we want to, to lead into today. And so the long tail is a phrase uh, termed in the early 2000s to describe really large collections of rarely accessed information. This was originally observed for, for media, for example, books available on Amazon. But it's a common phenomenon enabled by the internet and as sketched here in the, the lower right of this slide uh, for data as well. So in the original graphic, highly accessed uh, popular books and movies comprise the peak on the left, like the red shaded area. And, and to the right, you see a slow, long distribution that demonstrates, in the original example, rarely purchased, read, or accessed books. So in the sketch on this slide, it's been tweaked to describe uh, data in, in the same way, where well-characterized data is used a lot on the left, but lots of data potentially is, is never used, uh, the long tail to the right. So today we're, we're hoping to convene groups to, to learn about more data resources and talk through the organization uh, context of how this data, where it exists and how it can be better used. And the question I think we'll come back to 
is do we need better organization, different data, or all of the above? And so this got cut off a little bit, at least on, on my screen. Um, but the I want to say that a few words about the scope of the today's webinar because we can't address and talk about everything. And just clarify how we're defining Earth observations and remote sensing. Uh, so others may have different definitions, but I, I believe our thinking is Earth, Earth observations is satellite-based uh, information about the Earth, and that's versus airborne and ground-based um, sensors and, and observations and systems, for example, from planes, from UAVs, uh, et cetera, that we generally refer to as remote sensing. And as the AngerLynx theme has, has highlighted, there are many use cases, uh, and a couple include um, you know, monitoring and, and responding to disasters, better managing uh, resources, detecting emerging threats, and tracking trends over time. And so we'll, we'll hear about some of those today and then hopefully um, continue discussion in, in further forum. So just due to, to limited time today, I wanted to highlight some related topics that we won't, we probably won't get into too much detail. Uh, and these include uh, PII, USA data sharing requirements, um, such as the, the DDL, uh, sustainability of these systems and, and platforms, and more development of uh, consumption and uh, decision-making tool. Uh, there we go. So yeah, so more um, consumption of, of using these tools to, to, um, to make better decisions. So the outline of the the lineup and how we're thinking about this is having three groups of of uh, people and organizations, and so one is is generators of information, and the second is sort of aggregators and, and platforms, and the third is model modelers and and users and eventually end users, and so these aren't mutually exclusive groups. Uh, as you'll see, you know, the presenters today will all be doing a bit of these. Uh, and so we'll start off, we'll actually start off in reverse order um, with the modelers and users. And uh, then we'll go to a couple examples of folks that are generating the data. And uh, finally, the, um, the aggregators and platforms. So I already went through the speakers. Uh, we're kind of going to do some quick presentations about, about five minutes each. And then we're going to have some, some semi-structured question and answer. And then we'll have an open discussion. And, and Kirsten will close the session. So I'd encourage you all, as, as um, the presentations are happening, to, to share comments and, and questions through the chat box. And, and we'll get to those. Um, uh, as we as we have time. So with that, I look forward to the the presentations and and a rich discussion today. Uh, and yeah, now I I'd like to turn it over to Narendra. And um, thanks to all our presenters and and organizers and all of you for joining today. Look forward to to more discussion. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Uh, good morning, everybody. From I'm in Los Angeles, North America, and uh, I'm great to be in this group. So I'll be talking uh, basically about what we are doing right now and uh, what is my role and how we, I got connected to this and what kind of data is required in my you know uh, work. So could you please uh, go ahead with the next slide? Oh, next slide, I can do this from it. Okay, so uh, how I am connected, um, basically my background is uh, I'm a hydrologist and a remote sensing specialist, microwave remote sensing specialist, and uh, I work for the SMAP mission and the SWAT mission and a lead algorithm developer, And but also we have projects uh, um, uh, from the NASA service uh, program 
and these projects were implemented, uh, being implemented and was implemented in uh, East Africa region, which is still ongoing with some of the real folks. And we are active project in Lower Mekong uh, Basin. And um, the, the project is all about drought uh, uh, forecast and crop yield forecast. And uh, I, especially in uh, Lower Mekong Basin, it is the rice. And in, in the East Africa region, it is maize. So uh, what we do basically in these projects is uh, we uh, we have models uh, which I will talk about, and uh, we we run the model in the now cost and the forecast mode, um, and provide the um, agencies with the uh, output, and uh, we are still in um, um, our application uh, readiness level is close to eight. We are working with our uh, end end users to basically use it but we have two success in the US with the US aid uh, uptake basically in lower Mekong uh, basin countries but where the Mekong River Commission has uh, started using our drought product as well as the Vietnam Academy of Water Resources have started using our drought product so we are still working towards you know uh, provide them uh, um, the crop yield um, now cost and forecast for that region, so the project is ongoing. And uh, so this is the outline of the uh, model which we developed at NASA JPL by with my one of my colleagues, Costas Andrades. And uh, this is a, a platform where we have uh, coupled the uh, hydrologic model with a crop model, and this is a modified crop model which run in ensemble mode. Uh, they both run in ensemble mode and they are capable to ingest all kind of you know um, remote sensing data uh, and then um, and then produce uh, the output so if you see on the right side here um, we have uh, uh, we have two segments basically one is the now cast mode and the forecast mode so first the hydrologic model runs and provide all the input to the crop model and the crop model ingest and assimilate all the information in an ensemble mode uh, and then create you know um, the now cast and the forecast and so we do seasonal forecast three months in uh, three to six months based on the uh, climate forecast available to us so this whole model is known as uh, the regional hydrological extreme assessment system so it is uh, an evolving process so we are learning a lot from our users, especially those who are implementing the system in RCMRD in East Africa, as well as in ADPC, Asian Disaster Preparedness Center in um, in Bangkok. So they are the one custodian of this model right now. They are using it, and we're learning from this, and there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of uh, um, things we are still uh, putting in there, but the core model is ready and being used. And then uh, I will just go through one of the example what we are doing here. Uh, so um, this is just a, to showcase. Um, this is the lower Mekong countries uh, where this model is being implemented, and uh, and uh, the survey project that we are working on this uh, um, uh, in this region from last three years, and the project is about to end. Uh, but we are in a very good shape here, and we are providing them drought outlook. Uh, the forecast as well as the navcast and uh, and also we will be in in coming months we will be able to provide them the uh, crop yield forecasted navcast chat for well, we seem to have lost narendra um see if we can get him back on if we don't get him back on in just a moment we can move ahead to the next speaker uh, and apologies for a little bit of te technical difficulties and some slide formatting issues we are working on those but in the meantime, if you would like to download a PDF of the, today's slides, you can see them on the left side of your screen in the file downloads box. Uh, Narendra, are you still there? No. All right. I think our best bet then would be to move along to our next well, presenter. Hey, Robert, are you there and ready to uh, to move ahead, to skip ahead to yours, and we can return to Narendra if needed? I am. Great. If you wouldn't mind, we'll move ahead to your slides, um, and then we can return. Well, all right. I'm Robert Heyman. I'm with the University of California in Davis. 
Um, this is um, who I am. Um, we have several projects around spatial data and remote sensing. Um, today, I really like to focus a bit on um, crop insurance. So we work uh, mostly in uh, East Africa, in fact, also a bit in West Africa and elsewhere, uh, focusing particularly on uh, maize uh, as well as rice. And the rice is, is not so much in East Africa, of course. And so um, crop insurance. So crop insurance is this interesting and attractive technology uh, or, or approach that, that uh, to, to help farmers deal with uh, poor uh, years and, and to, to bridge that gap of, of a, a very um, uh, bad yield that they may have is because of, say, a drought. There's a lot of interest in it. Uh, there are some success stories, but there's also um, failures. And the question, of course, you know, why are there failures? And in part, it's because of you know poor insurance products uh, policies have been devised and, and provided to farmers. Uh, now, this is for you know. There's different issues around uh, quality here, but uh, certainly one important consideration is to to um, uh, evaluate whether the um, our understanding of variability in crop yields and when actually a bad event has happened is accurate enough to support uh, these insurance projects. So remote sensing, you know, is, is currently you know heavily used to to uh, provide an index. To, uh, to uh, underpin these insurance products. The um, problem with these products is that, you know, they're, or, or these, these remote sensing methods is that they're often um, ad hoc. They're, they're, you know, they're surely based on the literature and on other uh, examples, um, but it's very hard to know how good they really are and which, you know, of, of several approaches that you might take would be the most um, uh, adequate in, in a, under particular conditions and in particular uh, region for a particular crop. To improve these uh, methods and to evaluate um, these methods, we really need to be able to do a better comparison. Um, and to do so, we need a large, essentially large, high quality data sets. So essentially, what I'm saying here is is, is to, to have a much broader understanding of which remote sensing methods work in this domain of, of identifying crops and estimating yields and estimating yield loss. Uh, you know, we, we need we need to uh, you know um, access to high quality public data in this domain, and I, and and it's going to be very interesting. You know, uh, people will present. You know, there is data out there. Um, but often you really the, the, one of the biggest problems is you pairing sort of you know noise with noise. You know the the, 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 the collected data on crop yields are often very poor. So I think you know it, it warrants investment to get uh, a much better uh, data, or indeed help make data that's available uh, that that actually exists uh, make it available. Um, I've been part of of you know years ago of a work of a working group do, um, comparing uh, ecological models, this is on species distributions. Uh, where we were able to get data from six continents and we got modelers you know, of, of different sorts in, uh, in the room. And, and this sort of a bake-off you know, to compare um, these different methods. And that work has been very, very influential because we were you know, then for the first time able to really compile uh, uh, data sets with very different characteristics and, and have a much, get a much deeper understanding about you know, what works where. Um, Another very important thing about having sort of you know some good public data is that that uh, you don't have too much of a barrier to entry. Rather than like you know a few private uh, or you know or, or closed entities owning all the data and being able to develop something and just saying kind of a just so way like well this works. Um, I think it, I think it's a public benefit to have the ability to um, um, you know, to allow innovation in this domain. So we, so we really need, need better data. So I agree with the long tail. Yes, we need to use more data that's, that's out there, but to, to truly evaluate the ability of remote sensing products to um, um, do crop monitoring, crop yields per, uh, particularly, um, I, I think investment in actually collecting data might be warranted. I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Narendra, are you still there? Shall we go back to your... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still there. 
I'm through yeah. phone right now. Okay. So I was um, in slide number 22, which is basically, so what we are doing right now, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a coupled hydrological model, which uh, works with a uh, end-to-end modeling from hydrology all the way up to the crop modeling. And what we are trying to understand here is how the drought uh, ev- evolution and drought onset, drought recovery is affecting the crop yield, and how this information could be utilized by our end users for making uh, decision making and planning of water resources management as well as food allocation and other resource allocation. So this is one of the example uh, where we show like uh, one of the output from uh, Lower Mekong region. As you could see, um, we have done um, uh, this. This study was done like a uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, where we generated the now cast and the uh, sorry the forecast. Uh, it was for May thirty first. So the top uh, the top panel you can see. It is the severity index, which is basically from May, 20, May 31st, 2018, and the July 31st, 2018. And then you can see the forecast we did for the region, and it's being used. This uh, forecast is being used by uh, the Lower Mekong countries. Um, so um, we also visited the site, and uh, they confirmed that uh, the, uh, the forecast are pretty reliable, and uh, you know they have been using it for the decision making and planning. And similarly, on the right side, you can see the SM soil moisture deficit index. So the the model is capable to give you all kind of the suite of drought uh, indices and products, whichever, or we can customize it according to the end user's need. And the next slide, uh, please. The next slide is basically, this is the capability uh, demonstration, which uh, we are showing right now. And this is where we need the help from USAID and other agencies who contribute data on uh, on ground data. So we have capability to produce uh, the rice yield uh, county wise. You can see we could de- do it from Vietnam all the way from 2013. Uh, so uh, we have done simulation for 30 years, past 30 years, but uh, and we have done the forecast also. But uh, what we say here, this may not be correct because we don't have the right information, the farm management practices information, right cultivar information, you know, and irrigation amount being applied or fertilizer being applied, rate being applied. So this is where we are basically uh, feel ourselves deficient and need help from the agencies who have this kind of data. So the model is ready catering to the end user's need, and they're very happy, but uh, we are facing this problem of data collection. And a few countries have resources, and they are willing to share, but some countries, the data, uh, whatever data is there with them is not consistent and not what we exactly want. So next slide after that. So the constraints, what we are facing is the credible and quality data of farm management practices, uh, open access digital data not available, and few of the agencies not willing to share, and this is where we need help. And uh, some of the data are haphazard and the shorter time series. So if we want to, especially if we want to calibrate the crop models uh, county-wise, we need some time series data set of yield and other uh, indices of of crop indices, uh, which are not always available. And then... um, the next slide is uh, as a potential for so active collaboration uh, with participating a- agencies and capacity building. So we are doing it very actively in most of the surveyed countries. Uh, a month ago, uh, sorry, three three weeks ago, we were in Vietnam and Thailand, and we have a very fruitful uh, meeting with the, all the agencies. And uh, uh, they promised to provide us data, and we have to see what how much uh, they provide. Uh, and so we look forward to work with USAID uh, and this group to maximize the potential and chances to get in situ data and crop related statistics at country, county, and district level, especially for East Africa as well as for uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Narendra. Um, Philemon, are you on the line? Yes, we are on the line here. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring it um, forward to your set of slides. Um, and please take it away and let us know if you run into any troubles. Okay, in fact, we cannot see the slides, and so we're asking you to advance them for us. Yes, that's fine. I can do that. It, it would help if you, as you say next slide, also see the title of the slide you're on, just so I can triple check and make sure. 
All right, very good. So I think we'll be starting out with the mission and vision of CIMIT. I think most of you are aware that CIMIT is a member of the CGIAR and that we have we have at least a 55-year history of distribution of germplasm, the improvement of germplasm, and the um, evaluation of germplasm worldwide. If we go to the next slide, the global seed distribution of, of CIMIT um, involves um, distributing uh, improved materials of, of maize and, and wheat uh, germplasm. It's, the distribution is on demand of the, the recipient. And so the, the network that we have is rather ad hoc. Um, it's not always planned. We don't always have the same location year after year. But um, nevertheless, we have a very extensive um, network of collaborators worldwide. If you go to the next slide, the International Wheat Improvement Network is what we're going to be talking primarily about today. Um, this this um, evaluation network uh, distributes spring bread wheat and durum wheat and winter wheat lines uh, globally. Uh, we have more than 28 targets and replicated yield trials that we distribute. Um, and that goes to about 240 collaborators in 80 countries. Um, we have an enormous air freight bill because we're distributing more than 10 tons of seed annually. And it's all distributed free of charge and is, it's covered by the SMTA. Now, this issue about being covered now, this issue about being um, distributed free of charge is important because the network is a voluntary network. And its intent is to, the primary intent is to distribute seed to our collaborators and not necessarily to obtain um, high quality precise phenotyping. That's something that has uh, come about more recently, and we're looking at ways of increasing uh, data return. Historically, the data return rates have been 40 to 50 percent, but we're wanting to increase that, and we're wanting to focus on obtaining higher quality data. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Rosemary, and the next slide on the platform serving ground reference data. Thank you, John. So, um, our CIMIT, uh, uh, CIMIT Dataverse is a platform that we are using for publishing all CIMIT data, including IWIN uh, data. Uh, so, you can go uh, you can go to CIMIT website, www.cimit.org, uh, which take you to CIMIT website there, and then you will find data under the tab resources, which links you to a data page where you can see the links related to several other uh, data resources. If you click uh, IWIN data on Dataverse, so it will take you to the page where you can see the all IWIN data for that are published, mm, uh, published yes. And then there is another slide. Uh, there are, since there are so many clicks, uh, I hope uh, we are in the second slide. And uh, you can uh, also type uh, or directly go to data, uh, www.data.senate.org, which takes you to the Dataverse page. And then if you click uh, one of these published studies, uh, for example, here, I think 37th uh, S suite, and you will be able to see the metadata related to this particular study, and then um, the, all the files that are published uh, for this particular study. You can download all those data sets, which include phenotypic data, location data, uh, mean data, as well as raw data. So, uh, and then if you click a particular data set, especially for the variables and traits, the phenotypic data set, then you can see all the variables that are actually uh, mapped to crop ontology as well, so that like, you know, with the uh, make data interoperable. And uh, so these are the location data, so you can see also in the columns, so there are uh, locations like the Spain, uh, collected data from Spain as well as uh, from Iran, and uh, and uh, and then several variables data here. So location would be the most important data for this group uh, because since we are talking about this, uh, 
information. And then apart from the IRIN data, so there are also important data sets that we have, and then that is like in collaboration with KSU on the Feed the Future project. So we have generated genotypic as well as phenotypic data. So if anybody can go there and then download the, the, the data. So Tilomin is the one so who is consuming this data, and she will explain about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And um, next slide, please. So we're on a slide that says predictive modeling of wheat yield using spectral indices from high throughput phenotyping. So if you go on to the first animation there, so we have yield trials. Our yield trials are in Obregón, Mexico, and we have about 50,000 plots, small plots of lines that we phenotype using um, drones and airplanes. So if you click on the next um, uh, the next animation there, you can see we used uh, both a Matrice 100 using a red edge camera, and we also used a small um, clipper aircraft with a hyperspectral camera to get hyperspectral data. And then we have ground control points at different um, places in our um, fields, and then we also do georeferencing using uh, basic RTK GPS. And um, once we have all the images, then they are all processed and georeferenced, and then we have um, we extract vegetation indices for different plots, and so we have different indices like NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or canopy temperature, depending on the different um, camera that was used to take data. So if you have a thermal camera, we have canopy temperature data. And once all the data is taken, we have the different plots and different indices for every plot. And the next, the next slide, please. So here we have information about how this data is used at SIMIT. So we do prediction modeling. So we have all the phenotyping data, the yield data, and then we have um, genotypes data. So about 50,000 lines have been genotyped so far at SIMIT. And then we have the high, uh, we have environmental covariates like temperature, precipitation, humidity, and all those uh, factors. And then we use all this information collectively or in separate different models to train uh, multivariate prediction models. So we're trying to predict grain yield here using the spectral indices or using molecular markers or using environmental data. And once we train these models, we try to estimate something known as a breeding value of the lines. So we're trying to predict the performance of wheat lines for grain yield. And then we select lines with higher um, breeding values and use them for advancing generations. So this is a quick process that we can do to speed up conventional breeding. And on the lower right um, corner of this slide, I have some prediction accuracies that are within and across um, years. So these are two different environments that we test uh, yield for, the drought stress and the heat stress environments. And as you can see, within your predictions, using high throughput phenotyping data from, uh, this is just the normalized difference vegetation index. And that's about 0.46 and 0.56. So these are quite high within years when you try to predict. But when you try to predict, um, the yield across years using some previous year's data to predict the next year for an unknown future environment, then that prediction becomes challenging. And so one of the things that uh, we would like to see uh, is um, can we use some crop growth models to be able to incorporate a lot of other metrological variables and account for soil variability, microenvironmental field conditions, and use them to improve prediction accuracies. And that's all we have from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Raghavan, are you on? Or, yeah. Yes, yes, I am. Excellent. Um, please feel free to go ahead and let us know if you ha run into any difficulties. Um, yeah, I run into difficulties. I think I'm okay now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Raghavan Srinivasan of Srini from Texas A&M University. Um, I'm a faculty here and working with uh, uh, geospatial sciences uh, that includes all, all, all the components of GIS and remote sensing and GPS as well as the recently drone technologies uh, for natural resource assessment or natural resource modeling. One of the models that we have developed is called SWOT, stands for Soil and Water Assessment Tool. Um, this is one of this is the largest uh, application of the SWOT model in the world today, and we have more than 4,000 peer-reviewed publication, and this tool has been currently used in several um, Feed the Future projects, including a project called ILSI, stands for uh, uh, 
irrigation for small scholar uh, diaries for small scholar for small scholar farms. So in applying this, we use the Earth observation both as an input to the model, but also on the back end of verifying the model outputs. Actually, so in other words, uh, where we have some other dif difficulties or deficiency in ground truth data sets, we use the remote sensing data set to input as an input to this model. But also, on the other hand, we will also be able to verify them, like such as evapotranspiration or leaf area index and NDVI uh, biomass and net primary productivity and so on and so forth. So the model is quite versatile, and I think you heard some about the hydrological modeling before. Um, this is more for uh, hydrology, crop growth, uh, water quality, that's uh, including uh, pesticides, bacteria, nutrients, and so on and so forth. Some of the areas that we worked on, we worked on almost all around the world, actually. We have our applications almost uh, in every part of the uh, countries around the world and most widely be used in the U.S., the North American countries, as well as the, um, uh, uh, Europe and the entire Africa continent, actually. Currently, we have mainly focused on much more detailed analysis in Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Ghana, and we are also getting into the Western Africa in the second phase of our LC project. Uh, we looked at all kinds of uh, cropping systems, um, that includes all the way from food and fiber, all the way to forest, bioenergy crops, grasses, uh, um, uh, including uh, animal uh, operations, and so on and so forth. And some of the products that we generated over the years is uh, you can easily look at how much water is available, how much is the uh, soil productivity and the soil erosion and the soil moisture, as well as looking at uh, evapotranspiration and water uh, pollution and so on and so forth. We also used remote sensing to identify the reservoir operations, actually our reservoir management or reservoir water levels, especially when the countries are not sharing data across transboundary issues, we may have to use the remote sensing technology to identify the water levels and the potential risk of um, of flooding downstream and so on and so forth actually and we also looked at a lot of large wetlands like in South Sudan and things like that. Some of the constraints that we always face uh, that uh, everybody already alluded is uh, um, the availability of the data actually and the quality of some of this data set. Sometimes the data is not available uh, both in time series and the spatial resolution that we are interested in. Um, which is the nature of the data, so we have to live with that actually, so it's not a complaint, it's more of a, uh, uh, opportunities that uh, if more and more of this data that generated from European satellite agencies and the US and the Japanese and others could be all shared in a common platform, maybe there is a way to overcome some of these issues actually. And access to existing data sets from the local uh, again, several of the previous speakers mentioned that. That's the same theme repeating here. And those data need to be made available in a public domain form or at least in a somewhat easily accessible form, actually. Uh, the, the, the next topic of uh, big data is both an opportunity and a constraint. It is just evolving, so it, is, it's, it has got a long way to go in terms of making the data become available. Um, and uh, in a consistent and uniform form, so uh, such as the Google Earth engine is one of the uh, one of the fine effort to make the data available in a consistent form and easy access to the computing requirement and so on. So we are using Google Earth engine in a lot of our applications, but they do exist in different formats. So that becomes a challenge actually. How do we transfer data? Some of this data is so huge, it's not easy to manipulate them when they are all in different format and things like that. The opportunities, like I said, the uh, the, the uh, cloud systems as well as the big data initiatives in various uh, areas is going to become a real opportunity in the future for new research and collaborative research and be able to integrate both model data as well as the earth observation data into one platform. And uh, the validation and verification of some of this data is always questionable. So this is where we need some kind of a crowdsourcing or people 
could able to chime in and provide their input, uh, just like how the private companies are collecting crowdsourcing data for their uh, uh, for their benefit. Like, take an example of traffic. So now you can get a real-time traffic through crowdsourcing, actually. So similar manner, we could be able to collect data through crowdsourcing and improve the remote sensing or the earth observation data set. Capacity building is always required, actually, because uh, the technology is changing so rapidly. We have to keep up with, uh, on our toes to make sure everybody is on the same board and able to use the same technology and tools and uh, software and so on and so forth. So capacity building is a very, very integral part of any success the coming future. And so far, the real data is becoming an issue in terms of accepting model data versus remotely sensed data. Both are considered as uh, models, actually. It's not a real observation, so th those need to be supported. So that means there is a way to accept the model results that either going through a remote sensing or uh, earth observations or vice versa should be able to easily interchangeable and able to um, uh, go hand in hand in terms of exchanging knowledge and information and so on, actually. So let me stop right there and uh, maybe answer a few questions later. Excellent. Thank you so much. Estefania, you're up next. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to show you very briefly uh, the work that we're doing at AMA, that is the Agricultural Monitoring in the Americas, a very young initiative that was launched formally last year, but started in 2012. So AMA is a Geoland Regional Network coordinated by the University of Maryland. I'm a part of the AMA team with Antonio Sanchez, Mike Humber, and John Keniston that Alicia Wickraft leads. So who we are and what we are doing? AMA is a regional network that enhances national monitoring system and their participation in the GeoLAM community. So GeoLAM is a G20 initiative created in 2011 to work with AMI due to the high volatility on commodity prices. The AMA working group, while still developing its priorities working areas, broadly focuses on assessing data to information needs in the Americas, fostering research collaboration towards operational methods, including participation in the JCAM and RAP networks, capacity development and technology transfer in the use and management of Earth observation data sets so are producing actionable information, moving Earth observation information into the hands of decision makers. So which are the geographies and, and crops? AMA works in all the Americas, North, Central, and South America. AMA aims to have participation from all regions, regional countries. Some of the crops that we are we work are, for example, maize, wheat, soybean, rice, sorghum, millet, teff, beans, among other, among other crops that the different countries might be interested. Our partners are not only countries ministries but also NIAs from Latin America, nonprofit associations, among others. So the constraints. Well, as AMA, we try to make Earth observation accessible to different users levels, like regional, national, and also local. So after assessing data to information needs in the Americas, we discovered that there are many public resources for remote sensing data that are free, such as Earth observation-based products like crop maps, calendars, yields, um, Earth observation-based tools, tabular data, and then like cut that tools like webinars and training models. But the problem that we found in the Americas, especially in South America and the Caribbean, is that not everyone is aware of those resources. And there are also many good national resources for remote sensing, but they are sometimes hard to find or they are located in very specific portals where that are not very well known for the international community and sometimes even for the same countries. So here we saw uh, an opportunity. We found a need for a centralized place to find regional earth observation data. We realized the, the important need that the AMA community had for understanding and finding different earth observation products, not only for their own regions, but also for other places. 
So we start developing a section in our website called resources where with the help of all the partners, we start populating with different data sets like tutorial, presentations, links to, to databases, crop maps, and even some uh, reports that partners are producing like monthly or weekly. Uh, but we reach to a point that we need to go a step further to make this effort more collaborative. So with the help of my, my colleagues, uh, Antonio Sanchez, John Keniston, and my Humber, we developed the AMA Resource Hub. So this platform uses uh, GeoNode software together with a combination of other software such as GeoServer. So the idea of the hub is that it's a framework, an environment that facilitates a series of complex structures to manage resources such as database maps and any earth observation needs that the, the users might have. So the idea is for our partners to be able to share the information that they have, tutorials, for example, or, or conference that they go uh, to, like also georeference data, but in a very user-friendly environment. So we started this new platform early this year, and we're going live this week. So you can access using the, the website that is in the screen. So far, the, the contributions and instructors are being very positive, and we're excited with the opportunity of making these things easier for the end users and for the generation, generators. And also the idea is that it's a, a collaborative community. Um, for any of our partners, we try to help them with a, any issues that they might have, or like to locate specific resources that they might need, uh, or different ways to show the, the work that they are doing in, in the different locations. So well, that's all. Thank you very much for the time. Thanks very much, Estefania. All right, last but not least, we have Joe Ku. I think you've been able to see uh, here, speak again. There was a little blip right there, but I think you found it okay. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're, you're a little hot, but I think it'll be fine once you kind of get going. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, as the last presenter of the webinar, webinar today, uh, I'd like to give another example on the platform and aggregating of the data. Uh, so from CCIR side, uh, we have been also trying to understand what kind of data we have uh, collectively uh, from all these uh, data locations and how we can make them more useful and better organized for uh, the data modeling and data science in Earth observation. Um, so the map you are seeing now um, is the location of our research. Uh, we georeference like 15 years worth of our journal article from CGIR and we found about 1,000 research locations um, and other studies from 8,000 scientists from uh, all 15 centers. Our, our research stations are located in 50, uh, 57 countries and many of them also from uh, the CIMIT presentation are also being used for jump press and trials and breeding, etc. So we have lots of locations, lots of possibilities and data sources. Uh, but if you ask, okay, so where to find all these data, then the answer is not simple and that's where uh, we try to do a better job. So back in 2017, uh, CGIR launched a program called... Uh, and just ask you to back away from your mic a little bit. You're just a little bit too loud. Oh, it's too loud? Uh, it's <laughs> yeah, just move back just a little bit. Okay. Um, how, is, how about now? So, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, VR platform, uh, so platform for big data and agriculture is a program um, are launched in 2017 as one of research support platforms. Um, and we basically support agriculture scientists to harness the power big data. Um, and this, uh, there are lots of activities uh, being supported by this program. And the main um, kind of module or flagship uh, within the platform is called Organize. And, and that's where a lot of data uh, creation, data generation support, and management what is happening. And yeah, I'd like to just give a little bit of uh, example for that. Uh, the first, uh, yeah, as we saw uh, before, there are lots of data sources out there, uh, but it, it wasn't easy to find where to 
uh, we will to go and what kind of data is being generated from CGIR. So we are uh, working together with all these two CGIR centers, and now we have a flagship product called Guardian. Uh, there is a URL in the slide, so if you can go follow the link uh, after the webinar, you will be able to search um, yeah, any data set of your interest, area, and topic, and you will see what kind of data is available. Uh, the thing, another thing we are uh, trying to do a better job is not just making data open and make it findable, but also make it really useful in interoperable and ontology and other efforts are being added. Uh, like, for example, uh, this slide is uh, illustrating our effort to create a use case together with crop modeling community uh, so, so that they can find data from different sources, in this case three different sources, uh, link them together uh, on the fly uh, for the uh, most useful format for crop modeling application. We, we try to continue exploring ways to make our data more useful um, and get yeah, more discoverable and findable uh, for different modeling communities. Uh, we, we recently ran a survey to our research uh, to geospatial scientists coming to practice in CGIR. And we found many different types of data, uh, including land use, land cover, land trial, and household survey data, etc. A lot of applications are on supervised classification and also matching outcomes using proxy indicators and modeling for scenario analysis. So we, we, we saw a lot of opportunities, the applications are already being developed. However, yeah, as, as discussed uh, earlier slide, we also have obstacles and, like for example, not always, uh, there are not always useful and reliable statistic data to begin with, so sometimes we just have to do our own data collection to uh, improve representativeness of our data and calibration validation. It would be better to consolidate this effort together. Um, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, with, with other parties, like for example, Institute uh, presenting in this area. And yeah, so maximizing value of data already collected has been a challenging issue within our institution, like incentivizing researchers to make extra effort to make better use of data has been always challenging. And we're trying to do a lot of cultural change and encouragement of our, uh, to our researchers to make better use of the data already collected. Uh, another thing we, we, think, uh, we start to seeing is that the biases in published data. Uh, we oftentimes publish more successful stories and data uh, showing significant like the treatment effect rather than you know really messy and uncertain uh, nature of our, our trials and experiment on the ground. So um, yeah, this is one of the things we'd like to also discuss with. Um, yeah, whoever has, has, is having the same problem, similar issues uh, in, in the research in India. Yeah, and also responsible data management is a continuously challenging issue that uh, as a community we all have to work together to ensure the privacy and ethics uh, are uh, being yeah, uh, handled uh, correctly. Um, yeah, and a lot of uh, still, <laughs> despite all the challenges and obstacles, a lot of potential uh, benefits uh, there, yeah, like for example, avoid unnecessary difficulty collection of data once all the data already available and in, in, in searchable format. Uh, and also as a researcher, I mean, making data all more useful and aggregating and make it uh, available to our researcher is, you know, uh, really increasing our visibility and validity and reproducibility of research is just academically really critical role that we play. Um, yeah, and yeah, strengthening our capacity was, uh, was mentioned before. And just another thing I want to point out is, uh, so not only aggregating data already uh, collected, uh, another strand of activities that we are doing, the standardizing data collection from the beginning. And yeah, hopefully we have other chance to also present that uh, in some other occasion. So yeah, I will stop there um, for more questions and interviews. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Uh, this is Paul Tanger again. I'm I'm reconnected, and, and apologies for uh, dropping off a bit there. But thanks, Julie, and others for helping resolve those those um, those issues. And and I'm glad uh, you all stuck around for this. Um, so I wanted to ask a, a question uh, to Narenda or Robert and. You both mentioned this in your your presentations and uh, 
it's also a bit related to Nafis's question about the data required for crop modeling. Um, and so essentially, you know, we, we often hear that there are specific parameters needed for, for data for, for proper modeling. And as modeling approaches get refined, uh, that may change or I think essentially the question is how how best can we parameterize and communicate better ways to collect data or design a specific program to collect data that would fulfill exactly the the needs for for the modeling approaches uh, hi this is Narendra so so for our modeling efforts, especially for crop modeling and uh, the type of end user we are serving, um, their basic needs are basically how well we can, you know, predict or forecast the crop yield and how well we can tell them what is the situation on ground right now. And uh, they are really they uh, they are really interested, especially about the crop specific parameter, the yield, the flowering date, maybe, or you know, like what is the health of the crop, like uh, whether the water uh, crop is experiencing water stress uh, or not. Those kind of uh, scenarios they want to know uh, so that they can do better resource allocation and water resource planning. So uh, what constraint we face basically, especially in the crop modeling, our hydrologic modeling is up to the mark and we depend a lot on re remote sensing uh, information. We assimilate them, and uh, which is working great. But when it comes to crop modeling, uh, it's a very human oriented, you know, like a lot of interventions are there. It's not like uh, nature take its course. Uh, so when human intervention is there, uh, we need a lot of uh, data uh, basically. Uh, to make it uh, to make an optimal uh, model run. So the data which we really look for is uh, uh, the planting date. So uh, planting date, uh, we have come up with an approach basically using our uh, you know Sentinel or upcoming NISAR mission, which would be able to detect what are the planting date in the region. Um, uh, so that is one uh, 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 data we look for as an, a critical data for input because the, it depends the ultimate yield depend upon uh, when we planted and uh, where we planted. So uh, right now uh, the local agencies are trying to help, but this is one of the big lacuna. And then um, the next data we look for is the fertilizer application rate. Um, what a farmer is applying, uh, what kind of fertilizer he is applying, and uh, you know what date he is applying. And the third thing is with, uh, the third. The third thing is the uh, uh, irrigation rate. Um, we have some uh, historical data, literature, and all that, but it changed year to year. So uh, we need some kind of you know uh, data, like what is the irrigation being applied in the region, like county-wise average, or you know uh, we can look into that and uh, uh, get a better estimate. And then um, the fourth thing is basically uh, the uh, the seed cultivar. So it's not like very organized, especially in these developing countries and underdeveloped countries where people don't buy seeds, especially from you know uh, from an agency or you know private company, the Monsanto and all that. So it's uh, the cultivars are a lot um, like the seed uh, genetic characteristics. So uh, that is where also we need, like, what is the basic genetic characteristic? So we are trying to calibrate our models. If we have, like, 20 years, 30 years of yield data, we are trying to do that. But it is a very big effort when you have to go into each and every county, district, and do that. Uh, and there are so many of them. Uh, so uh, that is where we need help also, like, what kind of seeds or uh, genetic coefficients of the seeds uh, we require, we, if we get some good priors, we would be able to calibrate them. So that is where we are struggling a little bit. But these are the four type of data we are actually looking for a very optimal uh, crop modeling, basically, for now cost and the forecast. So our um, agencies with, with whom we are working, they are trying their best. But I think um, uh, extra support will will make this you know project very successful uh, so far we have been very successful with hydrologic modeling crop modeling as an upcoming process there so 
that's my answer. Yeah, thank you very much. That's that's very interesting that it's it's more of a matter of just getting the local agronomic data rather than any anything specific about the other the remote sense data. Uh, uh Robert, so I don't know if you had data, it. Yeah, for remote sensing data, we are pretty uh, pretty capable. Actually, uh, and JPL is custodian of many data, and we are very capable to get access and use that data and assimilate that into our system, especially for hydrologic model as well as for crop model. So we extensively planning to use Sentinel, uh, SMAP, upcoming NISAR mission, and we use all kind of uh, remotely sensed precipitation data, uh, which are uh, bias corrected. So uh, we only lack basically in the ground economic data, as you mentioned, yeah. Great, thanks. Maybe, Robert, if you had a quick comment on this, and then I, I'd like to turn it to Julie to ask a, a comment from the, or a question from the chat box. So, Robert, I don't know if you had any comments from your modeling side on, on this question of um, of parameters of, of data that could help improve modeling. And if oh, not, okay. you need to make him a presenter. Yeah, we just uh, we just promoted Robert back to a presenter. He got kicked down, so we'll see if Robert is ready to chime in. If you're able to reconnect, Robert, I, I'm back in. There you are. Great. Excellent. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's hard to generalize. There's different needs for different purposes. But but then again, there is, of course, a lot of generality. But one question is indeed, you know, do you want um, aggregated data at a county or, or district level, whatever the name may be, or do you want, you know, a specific georeference plot data? Um, county data is very useful um, by all means. The, the, the problem is often that you don't really know how how good it is, how it was derived, you know, how, you know, uh, and so forth. So uh, to, to me, instead of from the remote, remote sensing sense side, if you, if you want to estimate, you know, what crop is growing where and what the yields are, sort of the, the, you know, the two main things, then um, ideally you would have, you know, field level, uh, high quality observations. And that's, you know, that's, and that's a real difficult problem because uh, it's easy to say, right? Obviously, yeah, we'd like a thousand fields in every district or so. Um, well, you know, we don't even have, we really don't have the technology even to do that efficiently. You know, with people do crop cuts, it's very expensive, and even those are very small subsets of plots. So I think a lot of innovation there has to, has to happen to even collect the data you you would really like to have to evaluate to you know to to to, to train and test your remote sensing models of crop performance. But but if anything, I would say you know what crop is grown where. And what is the productivity? After that, there's other things need like okay, you know, uh, management information about planting and 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 fertilizer and what have you. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. So, Julie, do you have a question from the, the yeah. participants? We've had a few come in, and um, we don't have a ton of time left, and so we are still collecting the questions, and we'll do our best to get them answered um, in a post-event blog post uh, and send those out with the recording of this webinar and other resources. So if your question didn't get answered today, we'll still do our best to get it answered for you. Um, let's see, we had a question from Ross Hunt who asked, in terms of catching rate of change, what data set has the highest refresh rate? I suspect it's Landsat 8, which can be every 14 days or faster, but is that actually correct? Is there something with a, the best refresh rate? More days could be a better refresh rate than Landsat, depending on the resolution. And Sentinel is also a pretty good uh, alternative, similar. Great, excellent. And um, while I'm on, perhaps I'll ask another kind of quick question from uh, Tommaso Cassarelli, which is, are there vegetation index alternatives to NDVI, uh, such as incorporating red edge, something that has been tested and can perform better? Yes, if I can quickly answer that question. Um, yeah, we do try other vegetation indices for uh, different um, 
objectives uh, for like optimum irrigation, we have like we do NDVI um, as an estimate of biomass for an optimum irrigated environment. But then we have stress environments, and we do have indices like photochemical reflectance index and other indices that we test. But sometimes the indices are quite highly correlated, and so they could be just correlated predictors and um, if we combine a lot of different indices together, we don't get very high increases in prediction accuracy. So um, we have tried that, and um, depends on the context, depends on the objective, what we're trying to predict, and what environment we're trying to predict. And um, we haven't seen it could be a standard deviation of uh, 0.1, um, but then we haven't seen any great improvements using different other indices. Thank you. Uh, this is Narendra. So uh, one of the upcoming uh, uh, technology or the studies people are doing, especially for vegetation, uh, which you can use is basically uh, Sentinel uh, cross pole signature, which is uh, VH signature, which is very highly correlated with the uh, vegetation structure as well as vegetation water content, and it could be correlated well with NDVI. The, another advantage of using Sentinel uh, 1A or 1B cross pole signature is that they are, are they you can uh, uh, have that kind of data even in cloud conditions. They are microwave C band uh, until unless it's a very very heavy rainfall. So it's mostly available uh, with a refresh rate of around the world at uh, 12 days, and in over Europe it's six days. So one, this is another thing which you can look at basically if you are looking at some of the vegetation aspects and if there is it's mostly um, it, it's accessible in any condition uh, clouds and all that doesn't matter so and especially when we talk of crop uh, cereal crops rice and all that most of the countries at that time of the year have cloud cover so I hopefully this data which is uh, um, uh, uh, data can help in those conditions. Excellent, thank you all. Paul, do you want to do another one of your oh, um, predetermined questions, and then we can come back to an audience question? Oh. Ah, I'm not hearing Paul jumping in, so perhaps I'll, I'll ask one more question from um, from the audience in the meantime. Uh, let's see. So a question from Jorge Barrientos. In order to build the necessary data set from the ground, besides technology, how do you create educational models for farmers, um, such as in how to maintain and keep their equipment running? But, but even also, I think, just um, in terms of in, uh, providing standards for collecting the data in the first place. Oh, yes. Can someone weigh in on that? I think there are some technology now coming becoming available as a, as I was telling the crowdsourcing data services where people can push data from their mobile applications directly to a server and receive information at the same time there are technology in the US now for the farmers are using to send and receive data to the crop consultants for example so that they can take a picture and then that could be translated or transmitted to a central system where that could be reviewed and provided feedback in terms of what what's happening on the field without needing to visit the field uh, and so on. So there are some technologies becoming available. It's still very premature uh, in terms of standardization or in terms of making that available widely, but there are a lot of researchers working on this right now. Great, thanks. I'm I'm back on now. Uh, so, a question, and there's been a couple comments um, related to this. And I think this is maybe a question for the Estefania and Jawu as thinking about platforms for for managing and collecting some of this information. Uh, how do you think about managing curation time and and resources? Like, who's responsible and determining what's the most useful data to to prioritize sharing and, and curation of. 
So if you want, I, I can start. Um, so in our case, um, our platform, I mean, we are all the time uh, in contact with our partners, and we try to discuss with them which is the better way to, to you know, to put together the data, to show it, and we try to put data that there is already online somewhere else, or that they are, you know, okay with the copyright and all that, so everything is very um, communicative, you know, it's not that we decide unilaterally where, what data is going to be up in the hub, uh, or we, we you know, change anything of, of the data. This is something very collaborative, and our partners are the ones who have, in the end, the, the, the decision if they they want their data to be uploaded or, or not. I, I hope that that answers answer the question from my side. Great, thanks. And I don't know if Joe had any comments or if he's on. I'm not sure I see him. I think someone needs to enable him to speak. Well, maybe in the meantime, uh, let's see if we have another question from the, the chat box. So there's a question from from Pascal, uh, is it true that SWAT has been incorporated under FreeWatt software or it still works independently? I think this is a question of this, Tini, Sweeney. Yeah, no, there is, uh, SWAT is not included in the FreeWatt program. It is still an independent, but SWAT has been linked with ModFlow, which is in FreeWatt. So there is a link between SWOT and ModFlow, the surface and groundwater model, so that, that may be what you're referring to. But SWOT itself is not in FreeWatt. But a sister product of SWOT is called EPIC, which is in FreeWatt, so, which is only a crop growth model, not a hydrological watershed model, actually, but only a crop growth model is in FreeWatt. Hope that answers your question. Great, thanks, and I think that Joe might have his speaker enabled now, or his microphone enabled yeah. now. Uh, I, yes, um, so an excellent question for the responsibility if it uh, to make this data all open and curated and make it out there. I mean, this is really a key challenging question we all trying to get better answers to. Um, we, so for, for our program, like the data platform, we, we actually were created to address this issue. And yeah, we, we think this is institutional responsibility. Uh, this should be part of something we do, I mean, as a research organization, uh, not only make like publications and jump platform out there, also to make data and all the information we have been collecting during the process out there and make it more useful. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot needs to be uh, support it uh, financially and uh, also technically. So that, that's the thing we are uh, doing now, and I think we will get better and better sense of how we can institutionalize in, internally. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a really challenging issue. Um, so all this PII and responsible data management um, are also adding even more like overhead and uh, kind of institutional burden and management managerial burden on the uh, researchers and uh, manage, whoever ma managing data and information. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a clear and good answer yet, um, but yeah, we are trying to find the best way possible, and maybe this is something as a community we can all uh, do together. And uh, your second question, Paul, or what kind of data is most useful? And, and this also, yeah, a lot depends. And so this, this was one of the reasons we ran the survey. I, I quickly flashed it in one of my slides. We wanted to better understand you know, what kind of data are being used and how they are being used uh, and you know, other types of um, opportunities there. And yeah, it, it's really, uh, I, I think it's really wide, uh, <laughs> widely uh, various out there. And I think people are getting more and more um, interesting use cases are being developed by linking different types of data. Uh, we start to see not just kind of one strand of data from one source. Uh, people really learn a lot by linking different types of data. We, we keep seeing socioeconomic data being linked to 
uh, like nutrition data linked to agricultural data, also linked to uh, climate and other types of biophysical data. So um, I think to really support that uh, um, movement of big data and better organized data uh, moving forward, yeah, it's really difficult to pre determine this is the uh, important data or until we see the whole picture uh, collectively kind of linked together. Uh, I saw one of the comments from Brian uh, at kind of commenting uh, because of that uh, ontology and annotation and better kind of semantic organization is really important. I fully agree. Um, so we have to uh, yeah, to do just better job in maintaining our metadata. And uh, however boring it sounds like, I mean, we have to uh, keep in mind that uh, there will be use cases, there will be insight beyond what we already saw or what the data was initially uh, developed for and uh, prepared for. Right. So I think we have to be yeah, prepared right. for that. Okay. Great. Thanks, Thanks a lot. So um, thanks, everybody. Um, just to wrap up, I just want to say that this has been a fa fantastic discussion. Um, and thanks, everybody, for your patience with our technical difficulties. Um, but thank you even more for a really rich, enlightening exchange. Um, you know, at, at USAID, we're in a, a fortunate position where we have the opportunity to talk with different groups and individuals all working on different aspects around a similar domain. And so we have the opportunity to get different perspectives on things like availability of and access to the data that are needed um, to feed the Earth observation-based models that we all feel hold quite a bit of promise in terms of helping us better describe and understand the function of um, agricultural systems around the world. So on the one hand, we would hear from our colleagues and partners who need those ground reference data to inform their Earth observation-based models. Um, and as you heard today, what we've, we would always hear there's a, clearly an urgent need for more high quality and preferably public data on things like crop yields, but also on things like uh, georeferenced agricultural plot perimeters, which kind of in the aggregate constitute a really important type of data infrastructure for national ministries of agriculture. Um, crop classification information, directly observed soil characteristics data. Um, there's a lot of demand for ground reference data on these subjects so that they can also be fed into Earth observation-based models. And then on the other hand, we also hear a lot from our uh, other colleagues and partners, um, like Simit and others, that they've got lots of data that are available. Um, but as was pointed out today, even, even making those data available isn't always enough. I mean, it's, it's certainly the first and a very large step in the right direction, but um, kind of moving towards making the data more easily findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is kind of what, what we want to help the, the field aim for. And so then at the same time, we're also aware of efforts like, like those at uh, GeoGlan AMA and the CGIR uh, big data platform that are ramping up. So really what we wanted to accomplish today was to bring representatives of those kind of uh, three groups together so we could learn about our respective work and share it, share it with everybody who's joined us today. Um, to hear from our colleagues, uh, both um, you know everybody who's joined the webinar, um, kind of about what their interests in this topic are, and um, to share insights about the kinds of data this community needs to advance the science in our respective domains, and kind of how can we help each other move forward in our respective work. Um, and I think in order to do that, um, it, it really does require kind of a community of practitioners working in this area who also you know, make the time and space to, to come together as a community and, and exchange information, which, as we know, isn't always easy to do. But um, I, I hope that this has been a good initial step in that right direction, and we hope to be able to continue the conversation. So there's a poll question up there that kind of asks for your uh, insights or opinions on how you might like to continue engaging in this community in the future. One of the things that we'll also do is when Everlink sends out um, the link to the uh, recorded webinar. We're also going to send out um, an opportunity for you to opt in to a community like a like a listserv, so that we can that that, that will help us kind of facilitate or continue the conversation and, and keep this this community of interested uh, researchers um, involved and together around this topic. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Thank you all for joining. Uh, thanks to the KBL team. To your team for hosting, the AgriLinks team um, for hosting this webinar, and uh, we'll be in touch for future AgriLinks events. Hope okay. to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody.
Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.